struggling against the ropes that secured her wrists, she released a scream filled with pure dread, a harrowing cry emanating from the core of her primal fear. Before her, the wolf tilted its head, growling menacingly as it shifted from side to side, its teeth exposed and ears flattened. This was a scenario far beyond her darkest nightmares, a situation she never imagined facing. Vera Papov and her twin brother, Vlad Gilov, lived in the foothills of the Caucasus Mountains in Russia. From a young age, Vera was enthralled by wolves, leading both siblings into a life dedicated to the conservation and research of these captivating animals. Vera's enthusiasm for close encounters with these majestic creatures also inspired Vlad to pursue this path with her following her graduation after the fall of the Soviet Union. Their father used his connections to build a substantial fortune. Upon his death, he left behind enough wealth to sustain several generations. Despite this, the twins were not swayed by the allure of a lavish lifestyle, choosing instead to follow their passion for wildlife conservation. Their lives changed dramatically when Vera, just shy of her 25th birthday, fell deeply in love with Boris Mogilevich, a man with a reputation for being untamed. Vlad was skeptical about Boris from the start, advising Vera of his ties to the Russian mob. Ignoring her brother's warnings, Vera remained committed to Boris. Even as it became clear his wealth was amassed through questionable means and allegations of human trafficking emerged, her loyalty was further challenged when she saw Boris violently attack a colleague. Boris then explicitly threatened her, hinting at dire consequences if she ever disclosed what she had witnessed. As the complexities in Boris's life escalated, Russian law enforcement and Interpol began to scrutinize his dealings, eventually issuing arrest warrants for human trafficking and money laundering. Despite her increasing apprehension, Vera stayed by Boris's side, driven more by fear than devotion. One evening, while Vera was alone in their apartment in Russia, she received a knock at the door. It was the Pityak who revealed that Boris was now a target within the Bratva, a revelation that terrified her. The Bratva was known as one of the most formidable forces in the underworld. And this news marked a turning point in her perilous association with Boris. Vera's life reached a critical juncture when she found herself entangled with notorious organized crime syndicates known for their merciless violence and complete disregard for human life. Encounters with these groups typically spelled doom. They were also notorious for their cruel torture methods, using each act of violence to instill terror and serve as a stark warning against betrayal. A police officer warned Vera that her life was in grave danger as they were close to capturing Boris, a crime boss who would surely suspect her role in his apprehension, prompting him or his associates to seek revenge. With no other options, Vera decided to cooperate with the authorities in exchange for a new identity. The trial was an excruciating experience. Boris's hostile stare and threatening gestures during her testimony made clear the relentless vendetta the Bratva crime group held against her. Ultimately, Boris was sentenced to 20 years in prison, now under a new identity and with the help of Vlad, Vera used their inheritance to move to a remote part of Russia, fulfilling her dream of studying wild wolves. The siblings bought a large tract of wilderness in the foothills of the Caucasus Mountains from the Russian government and established a leading wolf sanctuary and conservation area, despite the area's remote location minimizing human-wolf conflicts and reducing poaching incidents. The ancient myths and traditional hostility towards wolves in Russia still posed occasional threats, however, such incidents were infrequent and did little harm to their conservation efforts. Allowing for a relatively peaceful coexistence, their lives took another significant turn following a poaching incident in their sanctuary. In the snowy silence, the twins one night heard howls from two different wolf packs, followed by the sound of gunshots, a rare and alarming event. The next morning, Vera and Vlad quickly put on their snowshoes and set out to check on the wolf packs and investigate the poaching activity. The hike was arduous, the cold air biting and their breath visible in little clouds as they moved, both deeply committed to their cause. Vera and her twin felt a powerful bond with the wilderness they had pledged to safeguard, living out the dream they had always imagined. 
They found themselves about two hours from their cabin when Vera spotted a dead wolf. A blood trail leading to the animal suggested it had been injured before succumbing to its fate alone. Vlad, clearly disturbed, commented, This isn't just random violence. These hunters aren't killing for the fur, they target wolves simply for being wolves. He expressed his disdain by spitting next to the deceased wolf. An hour later, the twins encountered another fallen wolf, which deeply concerned Vera. Both wolf packs they protected had been healthy. The first, known as Prakir or the Ghost Pack, consisted of 18 adults. The second, led by an older pair, was known as Niker or the Hunters. With 16 members, each wolf was crucial to their pack. And losing these wolves represented a significant loss. Vera recognized the second dead wolf as a member of the Prakir, deducing that the first wolf was likely from the same pack due to the non overlapping nature of wolf territories. 30 minutes on, they stumbled upon a third wolf in a tragic state. Poachers had left a trap that had caught a young she wolf trying to escape the carnage. The trap's powerful jaws had clamped on her right front leg, dislocating her shoulder as she struggled. She was bleeding severely, and there was no hope for her. Upon noticing a cub, a young male about three months old, hiding behind a snow pile, Vera was administering euthanasia to the she wolf. Fortunately, the cub could still be rescued. Vlad rummaged through his backpack and found a stick of dried fish, which he tossed to the cub. Initially, the cub recoiled but was soon enticed by the smell and grabbed the snack before retreating. Vlad tossed another piece, and this time, the cub stayed in view, seemingly asking for more. Eventually, they managed to coax the cub without much trouble. Vera placed the small wolf cub into her backpack, taking on the responsibility of caring for the orphan animal. She invested much of her time and effort into providing a nurturing environment for him. Despite its initial connection to its natural pack, the cub became increasingly attached and protective of Vera. As the cub grew into a mature wolf, even Vlad approached cautiously. The wolf seemed to appoint itself as Vera's guardian, particularly when she was around, causing Vlad to be more reserved in his actions. Two years later, the wolf disappeared. Neither Vera nor Vlad felt particularly alarmed, attributing its departure to the loud noises from the previous night's festivities. They speculated that their pet, Ming, might have awakened some primal instinct in the wolf, leading it to return to the wilderness in its original pack. Raising the wolf had given both Vera and Vlad profound insights into wolf behavior, deeper than they had expected. They had never tried to domesticate the cub, rather. They allowed it to follow its natural instincts and find its own way in the world, which enabled it to display much of its innate behavior while living with them. Vera was drafting an academic paper on their experiences with the rescued wolf when Vlad entered the cabin, looking as pale as the snow outside, with veins throbbing in his temples and a look of dread on his face. What's the matter? Vera asked, recognizing the severity of Vlad's distress. What is it? Vlad simply shook his head prompting Vera to press him for more information, sensing that whatever was troubling Vlad was serious, she asked, is it poaching, although she doubted this was the cause, as it wouldn't have shaken Vlad so deeply, she poured him a glass of vodka to warm him and encourage him to talk, eventually, he let out a sigh heavy with fear and revealed, Boris is loose, what do you mean, loose, Vera asked, her disbelief evident, according to her calculations. Boris still had at least another 13 years before he could be eligible for release. He escaped, Vlad stated. Last night, I found a note in the mailbox in town from the police. A chill of paralysis swept over Vera. She had mostly avoided the wrath of the Bratva because Boris had implicated others during his trial, who were now more focused on seeking vengeance against him than her. But Boris was different. He would never forget her betrayal. His twisted motivations were unpredictable. A sense of revenge would drive him to relentlessly pursue her until either he perished, or she did. He won't find us, Vlad assured her, pointing out that she had left nothing traceable under her old name and there was no way to find her here. Vera felt a weight in her heart as she responded, Don't be so sure. He won't give up. It's only a matter of time. She knew that Boris would continue his search. Boris, caught in a tumult of emotions, 
had to focus on his own safety, which might distract him from Earth for a while. However, Boris was not one to think conventionally, his skewed perceptions of loyalty and betrayal made him unpredictable. Moreover, as a natural hunter, he would inevitably initiate a pursuit if he knew she was fleeing. Overwhelmed, Vera buried her face in her hands. Once she had fled, Boris's instinctive nature would compel him to follow. Life for the twins changed drastically overnight after hearing of Boris's escape, disrupting their peace. Gone were the days of carefree walks in the snowy wilderness, humming tunes carelessly. Now, they prepared themselves, heavily armed and vigilant as if on a battlefield. Vlad installed a sophisticated early warning system around the cabin to alert them to any approaching threats. He strategically placed multiple firearms within the cabin to ensure they were easily accessible from any point inside and fortified the windows with shutters. The nights when they could gaze out at the snow-covered Russian landscape, reminiscent of a fairy tale, were over. Their once joyful cabin now felt like the prison that should have held Boris. Over breakfast, Vlad suggested to Vera that they should perhaps alert the local police about their dangerous situation. Vera considered this before declining, explaining that Boris's connections within the Bratva might still be active, and given their extensive intelligence network. Even one indiscreet officer could put them at risk, Vlad agreed, recognizing the widespread corruption within the Russian police and the extreme lengths the Bratva would go to for information. Their best strategy now was to maintain a low profile, attract minimal attention, and hope that the Boris issue would resolve itself, either through police recapture or Bratva's intervention. After two months of living on high alert, Vera and Vlad began to relax slightly. Starting to believe that Boris was likely focusing on his own survival and possibly evading the Bratva, their security measures were less rigid allowing a trace of laughter to once again permeate their lives. The wolf pack was flourishing as there had been no recent instances of poaching in the reserve. On the rare occasions the team could observe the wolves, they noticed the addition of several cubs to the group. Vlad was preparing for a three-day trek to look for any signs of traps set for wolves. Vera helped him organize his equipment and wished him well before his departure. They made sure the two-way radios were fully charged with Vlad committing to check in every morning, every evening, and immediately if there was an emergency. After Vlad set off, Vera sat down to write a paper for an American conservation think tank. Her paper aimed to create connections between their conservation efforts in the Caucasus Mountains and similar studies of wolves in Yellowstone National Park. As evening neared, Vera prepared a meal and moved the two-way radio closer, anticipating Vlad's routine check-in. However, an hour passed with no communication from him, which was unusual. Another hour ticked by, increasing her worry. Both twins were skilled at navigating the snowy sanctuary terrain independently. Yet they always checked in punctually. Two more hours passed, and despite Vera's attempts to reach Vlad, she was only met with static, realizing that something was seriously wrong. She understood it was not wise to head out into the range at night. Nonetheless, she decided she would start searching for Vlad at dawn if there was still no word from him. At the break of dawn, Vera was ready, her backpack packed. She slipped one of Vlad's pistols into a side pocket and slung a rifle over her shoulder. After checking her ammunition and the radio batteries, she strapped on her snowshoes. The overcast sky indicated possible snowfall later in the day. Aware of the difficult conditions she faced and haunted by the thought of Vlad possibly injured or worse, somewhere in the snow, she pressed forward. By mid-morning, she paused for a brief break, sipping rich, oily soup from her flask. Followed by several deep gulps of sweet, hot tea, she ate two sandwiches, then repacked her flasks and continued her search. Vlad, she estimated, could not have ventured beyond the foothills, which now lay directly ahead, not more than a mile away. Despite not having found any sign of him yet, Vera remained determined. Vera realized the two-way radio was malfunctioning, she couldn't communicate, and her hope was waning. Overhead, the sky turned hostile, and light snow began to fall. Looking down, her heart sank into her snow boots at the sight of a blood trail. 
There were no footprints, which was unusual since even a thin layer of fresh snow would typically cover them, but there was enough blood soaking into the new snow to create alarming pink patches. Following the trail to the tree line, Vera found Vlad's lifeless body less than 100 yards into the forest. He had been shot twice, once in the chest and once in the head, both times with a handgun, not a rifle. A deep sadness overwhelmed her. Soon replaced by paralyzing panic as she realized her own danger, dropping into a crouch, Vera quickly looked around. Then, she was unexpectedly struck from behind. For a moment, stars danced wildly before her eyes. Then darkness overtook her. When Vera regained consciousness, it took several seconds for her vision to clear. Her hands and legs were tied with coarse rope, the kind fishermen use and she was secured to a pine tree with no way to escape. Sitting in front of her with a menacing smile was Boris, leaning against another pine tree. He played with a large hunting knife, tossing it from one hand to the other. As he spoke, his voice sent chills down her spine. You probably thought I'd forget about you, hoped I'd die in jail, or that the bratva would finish me off. Suddenly, he threw the knife. It spun through the air in slow motion and landed in the soft snow between her legs. Well, Boris continued, that didn't happen, and now. You and I have all the time in the world to get reacquainted, to pick up where we left off. We have unfinished business. You and I, Vera, still dizzy and her head throbbing from the blow, was paralyzed by fear. Her thoughts scrambled. What do you want? She managed to utter. Boris's ugly grin widened. We'll play a little he said menacingly, and then I'm going to kill you, but first, I'm going to hurt you real bad. Boris looked theatrically from side to side, spread his arms wide, and added, nobody here to save you, hearing your scream was like being in outer space, remember the film we watched, oh yes, alien, in a momentary snap, Vera's mind sharpened the second she spotted the wolf, all of this unfolded in less than a heartbeat, a large male wolf, slowly and stealthily, was approaching Boris from a denser area of the forest. It treaded quietly, its yellow eyes fixated on Boris's back, unaware of its presence as he continued chatting with Vera, in a sudden twist. Boris drew a handgun from his holster and pointed it at Vera, threatening to shoot her knees, leave her to freeze, or be eaten by wolves. At that moment, the wolf sprang into action silently, like a released spring. It lunged at Boris, grabbing his shoulder. Although it didn't get a good grip initially, Boris managed to stand up and swung his pistol to fire, but the wolf was quicker, biting the arm Boris was using to shoot. Pulling him down, the wolf then pinned Boris to the ground. Vera heard his screams, a horrifying mixture of pain and fear, before a eerie silence set in. Boris was dead. With Boris no longer a threat, the wolf turned towards Vera. It stood firm, head low teeth exposed. Growling quietly, Vera recognized these signs of aggression and braced herself as the next target. However, the wolf changed its approach, slowly moving closer, nudging its nose against her chest, sniffing briefly. Vera then realized that this was the wolf she had raised two years prior. Now wild again, a faint glimmer of recognition seemed to have saved her life. As the wolf walked away, Vera reached for the knife Boris had hidden between her legs. She freed herself and left the reserve to seek help, understanding this situation was more than she could handle alone. What an astounding story of a woman's bond with a wild wolf and how it ultimately saved her life. It left me speechless. If you know of any stories where a wild animal saved a human, please share them in the comments. We'd love to hear your experiences. But for now, that's all from us. We'll see you in the next video.